I'd just like to start by, um, by acknowledging my uh, present-day co-workers in, in uh, geoscientists with GRL, but also former uh, colleagues in Cognit from the information technology side of things. Um, as we've already heard from uh, many of the presenters, and I'm sure this uh, is something we share with many of you today, um, in GRL we spend a lot of our time uh, trying to increase the value of data by moving it along this, uh, this knowledge pipeline, or up the knowledge hierarchy, as Tom Beckman would, um, would refer to it. Okay? Um, and whatever we want to, however we want to define big data, there's an awful lot of data out there. We're very used to the concept that uh, there's an exponential increase in the amount of data. This, of course, represents a, um, a, a, a big challenge to us, but also very big opportunities. A big challenge because, as we've heard, from a number of the speakers earlier on, there are very big issues in data management in terms of cleaning the data, um, fusing it, uh, validating it, and merging it together before we can get it into a form that uh, we're able to, um, able to use it. Um, a lot of terms are used in, in, uh, in relation to uh, uh, the extraction of knowledge from this information, its use. We talk in terms of using our expertise and our experience, our education, um, and the, uh, the big promise, really, an underlying promise of, of uh, this process is that it will give us new insight. So this was the paradigm that was uh, very much hyped in the knowledge management um, um, uh, period back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's really the, uh, the uh, implicit promise, explicit promise made by uh, the uh, modern day hype of, of big data analytics and uh, deep <coughs> learning. Okay. And, and other disruptive technologies. I mean, when I was at school, disruptive was something that naughty children did, but apparently now it's a good thing. Uh, so, um, the, um, uh, so I should say that, that um, we spend a lot of time um, in, in this general area, in particular in relation to uh, uh, trying to help our clients in oil and gas um, to, uh, to, to find and produce more uh, hydrocarbons. Big data, of course, isn't anything new in the geosciences. We've got 100 years of wireline data and uh, uh, large seismic data sets. We've got 40 years of uh, multispectral uh, uh, satellite imagery and geodetic GPS data and so on, other geospatial data sets. We've already heard today about ways in which geological, uh, large geological data sets are being acquired in the form of uh, digital outcrop geology. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, um, those of you that were there in the virtual field trip session will know that in GRL we spent a lot of our last 14 years working in these sorts of technologies. We've also spent an awful lot of time working with geophysical and very large amounts of geospatial data. But the reality is that we also spend a lot of time with um, data, geological data, that is very rarely seen by anybody other than the people that have, uh, have acquired it. And a lot of geological data falls into that category, where um, what we do see is its processed outputs in the form of uh, company reports that sit on uh, files, company file servers, uh, and also out in the public domain in terms of scientific literature, published papers, uh, published maps, geological maps, and so on. Okay. I hope... Gary, is there any, Gary, is there anything that we can do with um, the size of the screen? Oh, okay, no, no problems. <laughs> right. Well, we can get most of them. That's fine. Uh, so another indication of this, um, in terms of science, of, of the big data, of the explosion in the amount of data, in terms of uh, unstructured text information, this is just one example. These the amount of geoscience papers published on the Zagros. Um, it was since 1969. Okay, we can see round about the 2000s a, a, a very steep increase, maybe dipping off in relation to perhaps as a consequence of political, um, geopolitical events recently, but maybe not. There are other little dips and it keeps on going. There's a lot of text information out there. Okay, we're going to analyse that um, by uh, using natural language processing uh, methods. Uh, that's a branch of uh, artificial intelligence involving uh, looking at ways in which computers and human... Um, uh, human language computers can understand human languages okay so I'm going to um, uh, try and show this live if we can 
Right. Mm. Um, so what I've done here is just take Ed Parsons' uh, abstract, copied and cleaned, and I had to do a bit of just, that is, just be able to paste it into to, to, uh, the, the software here. So this is a, a Ed Parsons' abstract from the first talk today, just co copied and pasted, couldn't paste it out of uh, the abstract booklet. What the software is going to do is to analyze this from the point of view of uh, natural language processing perspective to try to understand where the knowledge is likely to sit within that document. What are the key concepts that, that are sitting in there and where are they sitting and what's their interrelationship? To do this, it's going to analyze the text in terms of its, um, uh, its, its uh, vocabulary, its grammar, and its uh, semantic structure. Okay? So, um, if we, so this is running in real time. Uh, these are what the software, at least, thinks are the, the, uh, the most important concepts within this, uh, within this short bit of text. Okay, information, earth engine. And this is, they're roughly in order, so the first ones are the most important. Okay, and so on, we can see. We'll see some that uh, won't, won't agree with. We'll come back to that in a minute. It's not really an issue. And this is actually a very poor way of, of showing it, but it's the only way that I've got, or it's the only, one of only two ways I've got. Uh, a second way is perhaps more illustrative. As we just heard in the previous talk, we can use some kind of concept map or semantic network map. Um, and here uh, we can see uh, just a more... Um, a slightly richer method of displaying the knowledge content than just a, a single stream, a list of concepts. Okay, so we're seeing a couple of, uh, of centres of, of, of information within that text. Okay, Google um, availability, uh, Google Earth Engine, community, uh, Earth, image, and so on. There isn't a lot of content actually there. It's a very short abstract. Okay, let's have another look at a different example. Here now I've just taken um, all the abstracts from today, getting legacies, okay, data science for earth science, perspectives from industry, and so on. These are all the abstracts from today, up to and including now, okay? Um, including the people, that, the, the no-shows. All right. So it's a, a significantly larger bit of text. It's still pretty small in the overall scheme of things. Let's have a look at those concepts. So again, shouldn't surprise us that uh, collectively those of us that have spoken today are dealing with data information in industry, in science, challenge, text, in the UK, okay, and so on and so on. We can look at that f in terms of a, a more of a, a um, knowledge network kind of map. And what you can see straight away, yeah, a lot of concepts and they're, they're quite well interconnected, but it's not particularly dense. Those uh, a lot of those concepts are quite widely spaced out. That shouldn't surprise us because we're, whatever, a dozen people speaking on slightly different aspects. Okay. Right, so, so far, all that, uh, all that the uh, software has done is analysed that text in relation to itself. And the only thing that it has to understand that is our understanding of natural language, English in this case. Um, Okay. There's no domain knowledge, there's no, although all the text, both the text that I've shown you are about geoscience, there's no domain knowledge built into that. Okay. So we could choose anything else to, to analyse. Um, okay, I should just say that um, all I can show you really to the, in a way that will actually make sense are these very small uh, uh, strings of numbers, uh, str strings of concepts, excuse me, and uh, small knowledge maps. But in reality, if you deal with a big text, you can get very, very rich semantic structures from that text information. Because what's key here, in fact, isn't the individual knowledge concepts that are represented, it's the interrelationship between them. And um, natural language conveys a lot of knowledge and meaning through the interrelationship of things, not th just through the individual concepts, which is why just keyword search is a very poor way of finding knowledge in text. Okay? What's really critical is the interrelationship between things. So these networks are very important. And it's just a graphical display. In reality, behind this is a much richer, multidimensional representation of the knowledge structure. Okay? So, as I mentioned, we, we've got no domain knowledge, and we could, in theory, look at anything, uh, any sort of domain so far. So I've chosen, I should, of course, have put... I, I, um, the, um, the Scotland-England match um, from the weekend, from Saturday. But let's see what, uh, what the, the software will make of that, okay? Um, so, yeah, the central co concepts are laid lords, Scotland, France, okay, Thomas, okay, and so on and so on and so on. And we can show that um, graphically, 
Okay, laid law again is a, is a, a central theme that connects a lot of information here and so on. Okay, that's all well and good. All right. But what, what um, is um, particularly important from, a, from an industrial point of view is to look at uh, um, text information with relation to a specific domain, in our case, obviously, geoscience. Um, to do that, we're going to refer to uh, ontologies. That's, this is something that, that uh, has already come up, uh, come up in conversation earlier today. Um, so an ontology is, one way or another, a formal structure about knowledge. I like um, Dark Song's very forthright and typically straightforward definition. It's knowledge about knowledge. It's meta-knowledge. Okay? But their formal descriptions are ways of, of describing properties and entities and their interrelationships. Okay? So here's an example from structural geology. Um, okay, we've got this concept of fold. Fold, it's a type of structure, and these fold, ha uh, it possesses other elements, okay? It, it possesses geometrical elements in the form of hinge, limb, axial surface. We can say that um, we can put some sort of rules or guidelines, either strict or fuzzy rules, that we would expect zero to, to n number of hinges in a given fold and so on. Okay, there are geometrical properties, wavelength. So these are properties that would have an, perhaps a numerical value in actual instances of folds. Okay? Individual properties can have further sub-properties and so on. In this way, we can build up a formal structure telling us about the, 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 a particular domain. It allows us to express domain knowledge in a generic sense. Okay? We can um, uh, take different properties and use those as a basis for classification. So in this case, interlim angle <laughs> is used to classify uh, fold tightness. And we can do that again on a crisp way or in a fuzzy way. In this case, we've got the different uh, amounts of tightness giving us different classifications of, of, of um, fold interlim angle. And we have other types of properties, and we can go on and on. We have different ways of viewing this concept called fold, where particularly for, uh, particularly ways that are well understood to geologists, the view profile plane view, the down plunge view, and so on. Okay? And this concept can act upon other things. Fold can act on strata. It has actions related to it, folding. It has fold mechanisms. Okay? Different, different things can act upon it, and so on. Now, this isn't new. People have um, used ontologies for decades. Um, pe people have done this in geology and in structural geology uh, as well. Just a couple of examples. <coughs> okay. So what I'm going to do now is to reanalyze text in a similar way before, but now in relation to an ontology. Okay. I'm just by way of example going to use John Groh uh, Cosgrove's paper from uh, Jolsop London Special Publication in 2015 uh, on um, folds and fractures and the link between folds and fractures and fluid flow. So once more, we could produce some kind of knowledge map just uh, automatically allow the computer to have a look what's in there and we're going to see to what degree this will resonate with the concept with the formal structure of an ontology in fact what i'm going to do is um, th these uh, these are very intensive to build what i'm actually going to do is to cheat a little um, to uh, make things uh, powerful and quick so what I've actually done is to produce an ontology automatically, or I've got the software to produce an ontology automatically, and in this case, just by feeding it a textbook, well, one chapter of a textbook, Hawk and Fossen's um, 2010 publication on structural geology, the folds and fracturing, uh, sorry, the folds and folding chapter of that. These are just 500 of the um, main concepts of, of amongst many thousand in that fairly big chapter, and again, this is impenetrable, you won't be able to see very much of this at all, but uh, this is just the first 150. It's very, very dense in terms of its um, knowledge depiction. Okay? So what we're going to do is to see whether we can see how a given text, in this case just John Cosgrove's paper, is going to um, resonate in relation to that uh, ontology. lost it. There it is. Right. So there's, um, the, in fact, I'm not going to take the whole paper just for, for quickness. I'm just going to take his abstract and his introduction. So th and that's the text that's um, shown on the screen. And uh, once more, we can, so first I'm just going to show 
um, analysis of the text on its own, not in relation to any domain knowledge. It's just looking, trying to see what is carrying, what is most likely to carry most uh, information, most knowledge within that text, what, what is conveying the most. So belt, paper, types, insight, example, and so on. You can read those up, okay? And then here's our semantic network picture again, okay? So what is um, what I'm going to now do is this is Hawk and Fossett. This is the, the um, domain ontology built automatically from Hawk and Fossen's textbook or the, the chapter unfolding. Okay, here's our main concepts. Here's our semantic map. And the key thing now is that the software is going to try and see match up. It's not going to do that on a, just is this node present? Is this node? It's comparing two uh, rich networks, one or the other. Okay, in um, well, using um, uh, that's perfect. Yeah. Using machine learning methods, okay. So if I take my text again, this time I'm going to reanalyze it um, in relation to the ontology, and you're going to see that these uh, key, key concepts change. And that's probably the best I can do to illustrate it. It's very difficult because once again, there's a lot happening that is that's uh, difficult to illustrate it on a two uh, on a 2D screen. Okay, so it takes a bit of time. But now it's reanalyzed the text, and we can see that the, the central concepts change. In other words, uh, it, uh, if, we, if this is our general area of interest within this paper, this part of the paper, these are now the concepts that are most uh, likely to change, to be of interest. Okay? This is where those concepts have resonated with our ontology. Okay. So the relevance of this is that this is just a starting point, really. It will, um, it's the basis for which we can uh, establish which texts amongst all our uh, many available, our hundreds of thousands of texts available, would be relevant to, different, uh, for, to a given knowledge domain, okay? In this case, folds. Okay. Um, and we can go beyond that because we know which parts of, the, the, of, of a text have resonated particularly with... Um, an ontology and which parts of the ontology, then we can divide that up um, so that we know which parts of, of, of our knowledge space our, our text is relevant for. How are they relevant? We can see related concepts, okay? And we can see which parts of the text are relevant. And this is really the basis of a corporate memory. It's the basis of lots of things, a search system and so on, but a, a way of classifying documents in relation to their knowledge concept. So to finish off, um, in conclusion, so. Natural language processing, we can use this to map out knowledge structure, knowledge space in, in texts. I guess a message for, the, I mean, I know there's a lot of geoscientists here, but for AI people, I guess a key message is that um, uh, natural language processing isn't, is very effective. Although a big focus is on, uh, on neural network-based methodology, um, it's not the only aspect of soft computing or indeed uh, artificial intelligence in, in a wider sense. Uh, that is still very effective. Okay, we can generate ontologies automatically, and this allows us very rich, multi-dimensional classification of geoscience text. Okay, so in this way, what we're really doing is uh, our real aim here is to use this text information and be able to put it in the hands of human experts. Really, I guess uh, at this stage to make the, uh, uh, the most relevant information available to their point, uh, point of action. So what, um, at the moment, uh, we're just analyzing the, uh, the, knowledge the, the knowledge that exists in text from a generic sense, um, we, what knowledge is available. What, what uh, is really key is to be able, this is also something that was mentioned earlier, is to be able to look for instances of these objects. So, for example, this isn't just a fold. A, a paper that's describing this or a report that's describing this fold isn't just a report about folding. It's a report about this particular instance of a fold. And from that, if it's a rich report, we'll be able to uh, extract <coughs> numerical um, attribute data that we can instantiate the, those um, instances from the ontology. And uh, further beyond that, also really key, is that we can tie back to um, our legacy in, uh, in geospatial research to um, 
to address issues of location. So uh, this is, these are things for us, at least, in, uh, for the future. We haven't tackled this at all. But uh, when we can do that, that will make it very powerful indeed. Thanks very much.